Apex Express, Asian Pacific Expression. Community and cultural coverage. Music and calendar. New visions and voices. Coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. Welcome to Apex Express, news and views with an Asian and Pacific Islander point of view. On tonight's show, we talk with Hamid Khan from the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition about the impact of surveillance and policing. How is the LAPD spying on activists today? What kinds of people have been surveilled historically? And what can we do to fight back? Then we feature a discussion with Wazi Davis and Brianna Gibson from the group that organized Black Brunch and Ellen Choi from Asians for Black Lives about the effect that women, queers, and trans people are having on the culture of organizing around Black Lives Matter. We're also in the middle of a fun drive here at KPFA, so make a contribution to support this important programming. Give us a call, 1-800-439-5732 or 1-800-HEY-KPFA. We're your hosts, Salima Hamirani and Alec McDonald. Stay with us. So we're really excited about today's show because we've got some really thought-provoking pieces. Um, but today's also fun drive, and we really want to let the interviews speak for themselves, so we're going to just let them play soon. But I do want to say we really appreciate our ability as journalists and media makers to have a space like KPFA where we can air content like this. Anytime I've had an idea or a movement has needed more coverage, I've come to this outlet for airtime. And if you support that work, please call 1-800-439-5732 or 1-800-HEY-KPFA. You can also donate online at kpfa.org. And our premium for today is the American Revolutionary Documentary about Grace Lee Boggs, and that's for a donation of $100. As momentum builds around Black Lives Matter, activists are growing increasingly concerned about police surveillance. In Los Angeles, the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition has been working on these issues for many years. Salima Hamirani spoke with Hamid Khan to find out. How is the LAPD spying on activists today? What has surveillance looked like historically? And what can we do to fight back? So, Hamid, can you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your work? Sure. So, my name is uh, Hamid Khan, and I'm a coordinator with the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition. This coalition came into existence in the summer of 2011 in response to the rapidly expanding surveillance state and how the counterterrorism programs and national security programs are increasingly becoming a critical aspect of domestic policing. And on a more personal level, why did you find yourself so worried about surveillance? Um, well, uh, well, first of all, I guess as a person of color, as an immigrant, and then someone who is also of a certain ethnicity and is identified with a certain faith, although, although I don't practice the faith, uh, I'm an immigrant from Pakistan. I was born and raised in Pakistan. My name is Mohammed Hossein Khan. I'm extremely politically active. So I, I think I kind of fit into the much larger scale of the other that has been the governing principle in the United States where a constantly an other is created, whether it's the savage native or the criminal black or the illegal Latino or the manipulative Asian or the terrorist South Asian or terrorist Arab. So the other has always informed how rules are created, how policies are constructed to basically monitor, keep an eye on the other, to marginalize the other and to criminalize the other. So I am one of those millions of the of others who, who live in the United States who are constantly being surveilled and monitored and are a target of heavy-handed law enforcement. So the way that you're talking about surveillance is not the way you, we hear surveillance being talked about in the media. It's usually what seems to me to be sort of esoteric tech discussions about internet surveillance or open democracy on the internet, that sort of thing. I'm wondering if you could discuss a little bit more about the other and what surveillance is actually used for and who it actually targets. 
So I think that goes back to the development of the coalition itself. And the three guiding principles for the creation and the formation of the coalition were that, number one, that we need to look at surveillance, spying, and infiltration and information gathering, not just as a moment in time, but a continuation of history. So that was the first principle. The second one was that we need to desensationalize the whole rhetoric of national security and turn that into this notion of, you know, national insecurity, if you will, and how uh, these programs are used on a 24-7 regular basis. And the third principle was that we need to really start thinking of it on a much more grassroots movement building level, because exactly for what you're saying, we tend to disempower ourselves and hand over our, our fight to civil liberties groups or law firms like the ACLU and other groups who then claim to represent us. But what happens is that all the negotiations that get made during litigation, the community doesn't have much to say about it. So a very small group of people then, because they tend to have the the knowledge and the authority over the Constitution, uh, then represent us. uh, And then at the end of the day, nothing much changes. So we need to go back and debunk or demystify how we understand and surveillance and information gathering. And one of the ways that we've always understood is through the lens of uh, the counterintelligence program, COINTELPRO, that the FBI had started in the 50s. But when you when you look further back, before the FBI even came into existence, the local law enforcement police red squad and covert units within police departments had already been formed starting in the late 1800s. So now, uh, how do we compare that with this sort of uh, new form of data gathering through the Internet or the NSA? say, but when you compare it to the earliest formation of these red squads, they tell us a different story. And that goes back to, you may be familiar with the Haymarket strikes in Chicago in 1886, which were the fights for the eight-hour workday, which basically led to the creation of May Day, what we celebrate now. Immediately in the aftermath of uh, Haymarket strikes, Chicago Police Department came together and they established that, you know, that they have entered a new age of ideological warfare, where they, they saw that community and people were organizing and they're fighting back and now they were fighting for social justice, for economic justice. So then the police departments, which were originally started in the early 1800s, around 1825 or 1830, which were designed to be slave catchers, uh, and that was the original intent and the formation of law enforcement in this country, then over the years started taking on this intelligence gathering and spying on people and information gathering as well. And then how that information was used very effectively uh, to neutralize movements, very effectively to sell that information to to rich people, to to manufacturing companies where people were fighting for economic justice. So when you move a little uh, fast forward in history, that's what you see what the intent of COINTELPRO was to discredit, to dismantle, and to neutralize movements for social justice. Now when we, we start talking about the NSA revelations and Edward Snowden, first of all, that this is nothing new. This has been going on for, for years and years and years. Uh, there's all this evidence, and, there's, and I would suggest for your audience, if they come across a book called Protectors of Privilege by Frank Donner, he has very methodically laid out the history where information was being gathered by law enforcement agencies, it was being sold to companies and other businesses as well in order to destroy unions and other forms of social justice movements that were going on. So when the Red Squads in L.A. were finally busted, it was revealed that in the 70s, just in the 70s, the, which was officially known as the the Public Disorder Intelligence Division, that they had covertly gathered 2 million documents on 55,000 individuals in which every nonprofit had been infiltrated. There were over 200 nonprofits, including the Catholic Workers, NLG, and every other nonprofit. Every city council member in Los Angeles office was infiltrated. You know, so in order for us to really kind of look at it with a much more deeper lens and unpack the whole uh, architecture of surveillance, it's necessary that we don't get caught up into the NSA type, uh, you know, social media type information gathering, because what happens is then our fight is only narrowed down to issues of privacy. And quite frankly, privilege of privacy is a white privilege as well. 
because people of color and communities of color in the United States, first of all, have never had the full protection of the Constitution because the Constitution is always on a moratorium one way or another when it comes to people of color and particularly black folks. And if you're undocumented or if you're transgendered, I mean, anybody who is a suspicious person who's been deemed the other or the suspect, really there is not a whole lot of constitutional protection. And then our lives are always up and bared constantly, so there is no privacy to save it. So I think people who do talk about, uh, while I absolutely am um, in support to fight back at how NSA is is going into our social media, but, but I think we cannot narrow our fight to that. It is only one small piece of a much larger apparatus, which is constantly surveilling, spying, and infiltrating our lives. So I don't know if that answers your question, but... <laughs> I think the big thing that I'm taking from what you're saying is that we need to stop thinking about surveillance as the fight for privacy, something that people of color have not necessarily ever had, and switch to thinking about surveillance as a form of social control. There is also a historical connection, for example, with surveilling poverty in general in the U.S. That's been going on since the colonies. So outside of just subduing movements, there also seems to be this way that we use surveillance to punish people, punish people for being poor. And it's kind of like a, a moral judgment that they deserve to be surveilled when nobody else does. Can you talk about that a little bit? But I think in order for us to even start looking at how the, the other or these communities are being surveilled, we need to see that who are the communities where these technologies are honed in and fine-tuned and practiced and then used on other populations as well. So in order for us to examine that further, then we need to look at both the international use and then the use of technology domestically as well. In Los Angeles, for example, when we first started the coalition, for us it was also really to help understand and develop our language that what does being suspicious really mean? How do we even talk about being suspicious? The Stop LAPD Spine Coalition is based out of Los Angeles Community Action Network, which is based out of Skid Row. So when we started going out and started doing focus groups and speaking to homeless folks or people who are unhoused, I mean, for them, surveillance was nothing new. But one thing was very uniquely that came through as well, that the experiment of cameras you know, so if you ever go to Beverly Hills, you will never find those kind of cameras and surveillance equipment that is constantly monitoring people on the west side of Los Angeles or Beverly Hills. But when you come to Skid Row or poor communities, then what you have is this massive and pervasive presence of surveillance technologies and cameras and everything else. So I think one thing it does is that this population is being used to now develop a skill set and experiment in this population to legitimize what they call behavioral surveillance and use behavioral surveillance as a guiding principle for policing now. That is now where this new form of policing is going, and it's called intelligence-led policing, where the way they define being suspicious is that it is observed behavior reasonably indicative of pre-operational planning of terrorist and or criminal activity. So when you break it down, it is like somebody's observing your behavior that reasonably indicates pre-operational planning that you may be thinking of doing something in the future of criminal or terrorist nature. So what better community to experiment and then build these programs on the backs of people who are extremely poor and then that's how then informs that how these new laws get created and then they get implemented in other communities as well. One of the examples being is the predictive policing model that how predictive policing is now increasingly becoming a commonplace policing methodology which is based on in essence using a crime data of petty crime being in a particular neighborhood in a particular zone in a neighborhood, but then using that and using algorithmic units and mathematical equation to criminalize a whole block and then flooding that block with police cruisers and patrol cars. So being poor is a crime. It's considered a moral crime in this country because your basic humanity is measured by your capacity to consume. So just by virtue of being poor and then by virtue of being homeless and then by virtue of being black on top of that, and if you're a black woman, then the whole surveillance regime takes on a completely different significance. So I think behavior becomes a key informant, if you will, which then kind of helps or, or guides law enforcement in developing these new policing methodologies. And there's something that I've heard repeated that vulnerable communities are often testing sites for government spying and that the reason they're so successful is because these communities are seen as guilty before charged. <laughs> so I want to keep that idea in mind because eventually that technology, the scope of it widens to include more and more people. So um, you may be familiar with the ESCOM 
mm-hmm. program that was used for the undocumented immigrants. Now, the reason why ESCOM still stuck around was that it was being forced and it was being pushed by the FBI to be used. And one of the key features of ESCOM was biometric gathering. So, so FBI used the ESCOM program on undocumented immigrants to, again, fine-tune the biometrics gathering on individuals, which now the FBI is called the NGI program, the Next Generation Information Gathering Program. The FBI has a biometrics information on close to about 75 to 80 million people. But what is happening is now that the L.A. Sheriff's Department, which is one of the largest law enforcement agencies in the country, is going to be the first large law enforcement agency that has incorporated biometric gathering program and now they have established a capacity for 15 million subjects so exactly like you were saying that these programs were were tried and tested on vulnerable communities but now they have become a part and parcel of our lives and that's always something to keep in mind that we are helping the government create these surveillance programs because we don't pay attention when they're being tested on vulnerable populations. But I want to switch gears for a second and talk about Black Lives Matter, because we're in a moment of high tension between police and protesters, and it seems like fertile ground for surveillance and spying. What are you seeing happening on the ground right now? One of the things that the coalition has been doing is that we launched this program of Watch the Watchers on May Day 2013. And since then, what we do is we go out into the protests and we kind of filter out on the street and through cameras and notebooks, then we start documenting what uniform the police is wearing, what equipment that they're using, what kind of SUVs are are cruising over there, what sort of towers and and forward-looking infrared cameras are on the backs of the truck, what are the different types of riot police care that at present? How is their partnership with private security agencies? And we actually published a report that's called Securing Impunity. And we saw several layers of surveillance and information gathering that was taking place, anywhere from Stingray technology in operation. Uh, there was even a drone that crashed next to one of the protesters to voice recognition to these military style, which they use in battlefield. It's called the forward looking infrared cameras. So there's a huge apparatus at play right now. And one of the key pieces that needs to be incorporated, and it's not only about Black Lives Matter, it is about anybody who is actively engaged in social justice movement, that, you know, we fail to incorporate surveillance, spying, and infiltration into our movement building and into our activism. There's a certain sensationalism attached to it, but unless we make that as a second habit and we become aware that we are constantly being monitored, information is being gathered, it is being stored into various databases like fusion centers and other places, and it is being shared with every law enforcement agency, not just locally but around the country under the Suspicious Activity Reporting Program. So the point I'm trying to make here is that there's a massive scale of information sharing that is going on. And what happens is that now, as an example, we are seeing that two and a half years later, cases are being brought up against the occupiers on information that was picked up back in the late 2011. So this information gathering becomes extremely critical. When people come and talk to us, there's almost a a prompting going on. But what do you think we should do? What do you think you should do? I think the question really is, that how are we organizing, number one, how are we how are we defending ourselves? And by defending is not through legal means, but making sure that we are smart and we are very clear and we are loud and we are substantive. I mean, it's not about paranoia, it's not about fear, but it's about being very substantive. It's about being very direct. It's about demanding that and putting it right there into the face of law enforcement and the state as well. The difficulty with all this is that the surveillance apparatus is so big and we do know that we're being listened to and watched that it's easy to slip into paranoia. Mm -hmm. And in that case, it seems as if then the state has won, that we are ineffective organizers if we're scared. So how do we take all this information about the ways that we're being watched and still become effective organizers? What's interesting about this is that even with the knowledge that the state is watching, the movement, the protest movement, is still extremely vibrant and very active as well. These young folks, I mean, children as young as six years old are part of these encampments, and it's not just occupying City Hall, they have occupied the LAPD headquarters. So I think that direct action is very much a part and parcel of the program. Secondly, there was a presence at the police first police commission meeting of this year. People were very direct. People 
were very clear, people were in your face. Raising awareness and being fully informed is something that we are doing it in a way which is not to spread paranoia, but to raise that awareness as well. And how do we fight back? So for example, that when this term comes up about militarization of the police, the way we talk about that is let's start drawing actual parallels between the U.S. military and local law enforcement agencies themselves. And then we need to look at the economic power that they have, the political power that they have, the structural power that they have, the cultural deference that they have, the immunities that they have, and then we start mapping out what our strategy is going to look like. Then the whole frame shifts as well as to what public safety really means. Because now people are questioning that why is LAPD getting 55% of the unrestricted budget of the city? So this is something I keep coming back to because... What you're saying is all true, that there is a lot of money going to the police, but then we have this very difficult uphill battle when we talk about reframing the debate because this idea of fear of racism is very strong. And so essentially what we're doing is trying to end racism, which is a very giant, huge fight. Does that make sense? Right, right, right. I mean, I think the the question also really is whether the fight is to end racism, because then I think what we are looking at is ending white supremacy. What we need to then start also acknowledging, and this is something as a person of South Asian origin, as an immigrant of Pakistani heritage, putting the white people aside, every other non-black individual is suffering from a certain disease. And the disease that we suffer, whether we are Asians or Latinos or Pakistani, or South Asians or whoever else, and the disease is the assumption of the privilege of not being black and how that assumption of privilege of not being black gets used to move our own agendas as well and then engage in further racism towards black people as well. So I think when we talk about ending racism, I think we need to also start acknowledging that on what are the different layers of racism as well and how deep does it run moving into white supremacy then then I think start looking at what are the structures of power and systems of knowledge that are really created that keep on feeding and supporting white supremacy So then how do we challenge those? Then how are communities coming together where they are, they are creating alternatives where the dependency on law enforcement is being reduced as well? What are the concepts of sharing resources? And it's not about romanticizing that or it's not about thinking of it in a very utopian way. This is actually practices people are engaging in. I think there's something to be said when information is shared and there's awareness that is being raised and people sit down and engage in a conversation there are all alternative solutions that are being developed as well. Thank you so much, Hamid. And if people want to know more about your organization, where can they go? They can go to www.stoplapdspying.org. It's one word, stoplapdspying.org. Okay, so we were speaking with Hamid from the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition in Los Angeles. You can find more information about them on our website. I'm Salima Hamarani. Thank you for talking with us, Hamid. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity. You're welcome. Thank you. You're listening to Apex Express on 94.1 FM KPFA. Right now we are in the middle of a fun drive. So we are asking you to donate what you can to support this station and its excellent programming. So you can hear voices like Hamid Khan and find out more about what is going on with the Los Angeles Police Department and their surveillance and what activists are doing to counteract that. Um, right now we have a phone number you can call to donate. It's 1-800-439-5732 or 1-800-HEY-KPFA. You can also donate online, www.kpfa.org. And um, if you donate at a $100 level, uh, you will receive a DVD uh, American Revolutionary, The Evolution of Grace Lee Boggs. And um, those of you in the Asian American community know what important presence Grace Lee Boggs has had um, and uh, her significance. So that would be a very worthwhile thing to have, $400. And uh, for $200, you can get uh, a Pass It On pack, which includes a large T-shirt, a water bottle, and canvas tote with a new KPFA logo, which will be make you the envy of all your friends to tote that around. Um, so if you could please give us a call and uh, give us your support. Uh, once again, to do that, you can call 1-800-439-5732. 
or 1-800-HEY-KPFA uh, or donate online if, if that's more your thing. You can do that www.kpfa.org. Uh, call in now and uh, pledge us your support. Um, Alec is actually one of our newer um, Apex contributors. So um, speaking of donating, you know, I've been thinking a lot about surveillance actually for a while. And I especially think about the ways it's not being covered and talked about. And people are not talking about the way surveillance has been used historically. And they're certainly not talking about surveillance and race. And so when I've wanted to explore these issues, Apex has been where I've gone because they've been so supportive. And KPFA has given topics like this an outlet. It's been a place to explore the difficult and confusing ideas. And if that's something that you support, and if you'd like to interview with Hamid, please call us and donate. 1-800-439-5732 or 1-800-HEY-KPFA. Or you can donate online at kpfa.org. Although women, queers, queers, and trans people have been at the center of orga- organizing around Black Lives Matter, we've heard very little about how they shaped the, and led the movement. I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time talking. Let me start that over. Although women, queers, and trans people have been at the center of the organizing around Black Lives Matter, we've heard very little about how they shaped and led the movement. Up next, Marie Che and I talk with Wazi Davis, Brianna Gibson, from Black Brunch and Ellen Choi from Asians for Black Lives about the effect that women, queers, and trans people are having on the culture of organizing around Black Lives Matter. How is the visible leadership being mostly women, mostly queer, mostly trans folks, how has that affected the character of the organizing that's taken place so far? Historically, queer and trans folks and women have always been at the forefront of the struggle. And it's not until, you know, now what we're seeing is this, in this really unique way, we're able to be just like hyper visible and, you know, show our faces in this way that we haven't seen throughout history. One of the ways... Yeah, that I feel like it's impacted the movement is it's like continuous accountability. Everything that we're seeing as far as the violence is a direct effect of, you know, these systems of hate, these systems of violence like patriarchy, like hyper masculinity, heteronormativity, all those things. And so when you when you come into it with a more queer kind of framework, then you're saying like we're going to do without all of those things that have been harming us for so long. And so I definitely think that. A little bit of the impact there is is adding to the accountability piece. I mean, I definitely agree with everything that Wazi just said. And it's also just reflective of what people have been saying in the Black Lives Matter movement that all Black Lives Matter. So we're not just talking about, like, cis Black men. We're talking about everyone. Yeah, and so let's be specific. What is the difference between a movement that's led by mostly cis straight men versus this particular movement led by women, led by queer folks, led by trans folks. What is that, What are the actual differences that you're seeing? For me, it's two ways. Like one, on the actual experiential, like how I experience meetings and how I experience just building relationships with people and other leadership and other groups. I think what we're experiencing is a lot less ego. And I think that's deeply connected to the lack of hypermasculinity in a space where I experience a lot of ego or I have in the past. And so people are coming much more open to taking leadership in a broader way. Also, people are coming with like really loving accountability, like direct person to person. Like I feel like feminine leadership, queer, trans women are holding this uh, this line of accountability to check each other that comes from love in a like gentle and fierce way. And so I experienced that too in the space in a way that I appreciate. And then just on the like political tip, I think in all of our movements, we try really hard to be holistic in our analysis and gender is often left out and we're like pushing that. And so in this one, actually the leadership is such a spectrum of gender and and actually has queer trans and women leadership. It's like gender is already central to the conversation. So it's just easier to weave that in. And another thing I hell of appreciate about it. Just about what you were saying around the, the whole ego thing. Like it's, I think it's definitely a real thing. And Something I think is really special about this movement is we're trying really hard to decentralize the leadership, both in the visibility of like who's being seen, the faces that are being seen, right, that are behind this movement, as well as like who's taking, filling in what roles. And I think that's really important because like in the black history that we're taught, you know, we're taught figures like Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Al Sharpton, Jesse Jackson. It's this constant male black religious figures 
who were definitely fighting for our liberation, but there's no conversation around Bayard Rustin or Marsha P. Johnson, who are like queer black folks who were actually behind all of the organizing and pushing a lot of those agendas. Their legacies have been invisibilized and erased in this really violent way. Part of it, I think that's really great now is almost like relearning our history, right? Like, and and seeing history being made as well, right before our eyes. Why do you think so far the media hasn't spoken about the obvious queer leadership of the movement? It's been mostly ignored. Why do you think that is? I ain't ready. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, introducing queerness into the conversation means ultimately dismantling heteropatriarchy, right? Which is like what this nation is built on. And (laughs) is this nation really ready for that? It means giving up a whole lot of power and privilege. And so the media is definitely a part of those systems that help to uphold those certain hierarchies. The (laughs) mass media and mainstream isn't ready for a lot of aspects of our movement. Um, And like, that's part of it. They're not ready for us saying that we want a decentralized movement. And so that's why people keep calling for a leader. And then, yeah, they're definitely not ready for to talk about women being at the forefront or queer and trans folk being at the forefront and those intersections as well. So given that we haven't even come to terms with the way in which we silence people in the past and or erase certain histories, it certainly makes sense that they're not reporting on it today because we're not at that point. We're still not ready or they're not ready. We are. <laughs> right. Right. Another thing that comes to mind is that feminine values are revolutionary values, like this idea that caring and empathy and stuff. Where do you see space for those values within the context of the organizing that's happening today? Well, it's funny because um, we were just having a conversation about self-care and sustainability before we started this interview. And I think what's interesting is so we're like a couple months, few months into this moment. And I'm constantly, in a beautiful way, getting reminded to take care of myself. And it's interesting that a lot of that comes from queer trans women um, and women that I feel like feminine leadership is just in general bolder about care and more outspoken about that. And just like pays attention to that more. And, you know, we have a couple, for example, also healers who are in our space who are like bringing medicine and bringing just advice and stuff into the space. And that's so dope and beautiful. And I haven't experienced that much before in, you know, mass like organizing groups. How has the leadership being mostly women, being mostly trans folks and queer folks, how has that been received by by cis men, by straight men, um, especially men of color and other black men? So in my personal experience, I haven't received a ton of negative energy from straight cis males. And I think that some of that is because, especially in the Bay Area, I feel like you know what you're walking into. And so you kind of like consciously made the decision that that's where you're going to be. And or you get there and you realize that you're outnumbered. I do think, however, I've felt that On a larger scale, I've heard of different people's experiences with men telling them that they need to be at home or you shouldn't be out here, (laughs) you should be somewhere else, or especially with women who have children definitely being told that they don't belong on the front lines and you belong at home and you shouldn't have the baby out here and let us do this. And that's been hard for those individuals who I've heard speak on it to deal with and also they refuse to be turned around on lower frequencies i i hear questions around like where are the men and it's also often tied to the idea right that we're just fighting for men's lives because the line that i've heard often is where are the men we have all of these women here fighting for us and you don't see us like well one we're not just fighting for you (laughs) we're fighting for ourselves I think in general, men feel like they can tell me how to lead. They question a lot more. And I think in a general sense, we probably are experiencing that just like leadership when it's not cis male people just in the society feel like there's more open roads to just question. And there's probably a higher level of critique of leadership because of that. But I do want to just shout out We do have a number of straight cis males in our grouping that have really stepped up in a dope way, um, stepped up by making space 
for the leadership that exists now. And so I think that's important, too, for that, them to hold the line and then for the existing leadership, queer trans women leadership, to just be bold and unapologetic and loud in why we're here and why we're stepping up. I was just going to add on a little bit to what Brianna was saying, that region really makes a difference. And for me, I, I just, again, being from Maryland, D.C. area, have really noticed the difference, um, <laughs> you know, in my interactions with all human beings. Right. Um, but also in, in particular, I have paid attention to just my relationship with men out here compared to relationships with men back home, mm-hmm. you know, and the Bay is a special place. And I think that there are a lot of straight cis men and, and cis men out here who who are holding themselves accountable to, you know, um, not taking up so much space and, and not per- continuing to perpetuate their masculinity because also like the climate of the Bay is like, oh, conscious, we're all trying to be liberal, all this, whatever, right? And at the same time, like you still run into, like for instance, we went to like a town hall at this big church a couple weeks ago. It was supposed to be on like the issues around police brutality and um, violence on black lives. And even the men who were like facilitating the conversation were completely patronizing, completely like paternalistic. The reverend who was there, he was like trying to silence basically everybody in the audience. He's like, y'all not don't disrespect my house. Everything was about his house, his this, his that. Afterwards, he, he was going around talking to people what I noticed was there was there was a group. It was myself, four other women, most of us queer, one guy, one man, male with us, cis male. And immediately the reverend, he walks through the group of women that are standing there. No eye contact, nothing. Goes directly to the cis male who was with us to speak to him and then proceeds to like talk about us on the side to our friend who is this man, rather than actually like turning around, speaking to us as human beings, right? Even that was just telling in that he felt like he couldn't even talk directly to us until after 10 minutes later, after we had been standing there. And then when he proceeded to speak to us, he was surprised, I think, that we had two or three women out of the group who were calling him out on the fact that he was being paternalistic and the fact that he was only uplifting black men's lives. And then he started telling a weird story about how the men are the seed and <laughs> and the women are like uh, everything else. And uh, but but we but we matter. But they they won't exist without us, right? But they're the seed um, of all life. Um, <laughs> you know. And it was. I mean, it was just. It was ridiculous. You know. We had to call him out on that, and it, it, right, Olivia doesn't. She's like, I'm not I'm here for this. right. She's like, that sounds horrible, you know. But even in calling him out on it, I don't even think I don't think he was halfway listening, you know, to our voices, actually hearing what we had to say as women in the space, speaking out on his BS, you know. And you know, again, we just have a lot of work to do um, because, yeah, it's it's rough out here, and yeah, I mean. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that, like, some of that also, how it would term our general affinity groups, like, oh, we're just all people who identify as black and we work together. We're all, like, pretty young as well. And we definitely have some older people in the group, but most of us are young. And so mm-hmm. some of the ideas that, especially, I think, some older folks grew up with, and not to say that we didn't grow up, like, we grew up in a patriarchal system as well, but especially the way in which they saw leadership, the way in which they viewed leadership and coming right off the heels of things like the civil rights movement where like males were particularly at the front. I think they still carry a lot of that baggage with them and also grew up in a space where that wasn't challenged as much as it is being now. And as it was like when a lot of us were kind of coming into our twenties and late teens and really formative years and they grew up in a time where it was really dangerous to question those things. It determined a lot about how you were perceived by your community and as well, like, whether or not you really belong to that community anymore. Because a lot of the groupings have been coming together, the affinity groups that are taking action have been coming together on the basis of identity. Mm-hmm. What are the ways in which identity politics has been useful in this moment? Our group was sparked and started coming together and why we chose to come together together under an Asian banner of identity was 
about the fact that the moment right now is about black lives. And so it's a very racialized issue. And so it's just appropriate for us to get together based on our own racial ethnic identity and place ourselves in how we relate to black folks and privilege um, differences of oppression that we experience out in the world. Just our, you know, responsibility as folks who the oppression of black folks is done often in our name. And a lot of our privilege has been built on the backs of black and brown folks, particularly black folks. And so for us to be able to identify cl more clearly, it just gives us, I think, a deeper understanding, a more clear understanding of how we position ourselves in the moment and how we can organize ourselves most appropriately right now. I think that's when identity politics has helped us and be able to articulate, you know, why we're here and why it's important for us to not only step up ourselves but to push our communities and our families where we experience anti-Black racism very deeply. And then just an example of how it hasn't been super useful is we had this really interesting conversation around using Asians and Asian Pacific Islander and how identity politics sometimes in like a general mainstream sense has pushed us to like form ourselves as this big like API banner of people. And it's just really interesting how a lot of times that's done in a way that's inappropriate. Like actually Pacific Islanders aren't a part of your crew and you're just kind of using it because it's like what people have been taught in like a mainstream identity politics politics arena as like the politically correct way to identify yourself, um, but it's actually not that useful when people, PI folks are not there. So for us, that was like one really interesting conversation that we had and why we're just rolling as Asians and then really making sure that we're actually having conversations with PI folks. Like you want a bigger crew to roll with, we're here to support you in the, in the, on the tip of solidarity, but we're not here to just like appropriate your community. For all of the all black organizing that's been happening, it's really dope for us to be all black and talking about a Black Lives Matter message. I think it definitely helps to solidify our collective sense of purpose and in a way that's deeper than just like, oh, we're all here because black lives matter. It's like we're all here because our lives matter and like our family's lives matter and our ancestors mattered and our children matter. And that's a unique space for us. And it's a really powerful feeling in a society that, like, often wants you to feel and does everything to make you feel disempowered. So all Black organizing spaces have been really amazing to be a part of. Are there ways in which you all feel that you've come up against some of the limitations of identity politics? I want to say there's definitely been some challenges, like comrades were reporting back from the East Coast movements, um, Black Lives Matter movements. In that there was like just a lot of trouble for them, the Black Brunch specifically, saying like, oh, this is a movement that has been organized by Black folks for other Black folks, right? And that we're asking allies to step in and support in these different particular ways. And then there were some allies there, non-Black allies, who were just like, what? This is divisive. This is separatist. This is like, this is only causing more drama, basically. And so I think I've seen a lot of challenges there around like identity politics and where they can come into play. And like when we use them in organizing to like uplift a certain voice, how other voices react to that. It's a difficult conversation, right, to have. And I think that it's one worthwhile having because that's also part of the liberation, right? And then also it's just that identity is such a spectrum, even racial identity and the fact that our communities have mixed race folks, have people with different skin privileges, have, and then on, layered on top of that are different economic privileges. And so oppression, even within like an Asian identity group, it looks different within us. And I think people are also trying to figure out how to check their own privileges within an, like another group like Asians. I think identity politics oftentimes like keeps us within the space of talking about race in America when really a lot of the systems that we're up against are worldwide international systems. And so how do you go from where you have all of these groupings of people working on the basis of identity and sort of race in America to a broader analysis? I think having had conversations with people who are international organizations, anti-imperialist organizations, it's the intersectionality of root cause and the impact of U.S. imperialism. And that it's not just U.S. capitalism, imperialism here at home, but that that power extends to 
many different places all around the world. I think what this moment is making me and others question is in that politic, what does it mean to be a part of a Black Lives Matter movement in the United States? And how actually the war on Black people in the U.S. is the domestic front of a war on third world peoples. And that in some ways, the war on Black people here and the oppression of Black people allows for the buildup of a military system that then goes and wreaks havoc in all these other countries. And so to me, it's about talking about root cause and also seeing our role here in the belly of the beast in an anti-imperialist framework of like to end imperialism, we can start here at home by ending militarism in our own streets Mm. and uplifting the value of black lives in the United States has everything to do with how much lives in our own home countries are actually uplifted to and held. If you're just turning in, you're listening to Apex Express on 94.1 FM KPFA. You're listening to a conversation that Marie Che and Salima Hamirani had with Wazi Davis and Brianna Gibson with the group behind Black Brunch and Ellen Choi from Asians for Black Lives. Well, you talked about your grouping being very young, yeah. which is something we've noticed in Asians for Black Lives as well as mostly young form, but you talked about respectability politics. And I remember, was it in D.C. that... Al Sharpton? Sharpton. <laughs> yes, okay. So can you talk a little I'll bit about what had happened there in that particular instance and what the difference is between the different generations and how they're interacting with each other? Mm-hmm. Okay. Al Sharpton's <laughs> event. So it took place the same weekend as there were like millions marches in New York City, Oakland, San Francisco. Al Sharpton and his National Action Network decided to hold what was supposed to be a rally or a protest in Washington, D.C. Several of the young organizers from Ferguson were also present. When they got there, basically what happened, it seemed like less of a rally and more of a forum for older people to come and talk at people. There was the odd thing about there being a VIP section at this protest and the fact that there was this long program of all of these people who were supposed to speak and the youth hadn't gotten a chance to speak and particularly the youth from Ferguson hadn't gotten a chance to speak. And at some point that did come to a head where they decided that it was their time to speak and there was a lot of movement to rush them off of the stage and then there were people in the audience who were in support of them speaking and then you could also hear some other people who wanted them off the stage and thought that was disrespectful. But I definitely think that it is reflective of a lot of the differences in ideology that I think are tied to generational differences. And you can even see that in like Oprah made some remarks and said like, oh yeah, I just think that today's movement doesn't have leaders. And we talked earlier about us wanting to have a more decentralized structure and that our leaders are not going to look like the leaders that you maybe think of when Oprah was recently in Selma, so I'm going to use that as an example. Like when you think of Selma, we're not that, and we also don't want to be that, and mm-hmm. we are fine with the type of leadership that we have right now, and it's clearly working for us. And some of that has to do with like respectability, who's the most presentable voice for the American public so that you can engender all of this support from people across all backgrounds, and particularly white people, like who would they most respect, right? And like who best presents us as human. And also that kind of ties back to our messaging though, when we talked about all black lives mattering, like we're not talking about just the ones that look respectable to society. We literally mean all of them. And I know that when I particularly talk about police brutality and state violence, like I don't care what the person's background was. (laughs) Like, I don't care if they just robbed a store. I don't care if they had just gotten into a fight. I don't care what had just happened. It does not mean their life means any less or has any less value. That's the point where a lot of younger people are. And we also have seen that respectability doesn't work. People who are kind of stuck in that mindset are holding on to it because it's what they've been taught. And they still think that at some point it will see us through. And yet we are decades beyond the civil rights movement and it hasn't 
seen us through. And we are still being gunned down in the streets and we still don't have access to a lot of the things that we need in order to survive. And we don't have access to these systems that weren't built for us in the first place. And we need to realize it's because they were not built for us in the first place. And no matter what kind of suit you have on, it's not going to help you. If the police are racially profiling you, you can pull out your college degree and they will not care. They beat a college professor on the street on camera. It does not matter. Yeah. Your respectability will not save you. It will not. Um, so, like, speaking of Selma, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we saw this movie yesterday and the whole intergenerational piece and the conflict between the generations, I think, has been going on for generations, yeah. too. Selma really was able to, I think, shed some light on this issue um, because it did show the conflict between the young folks and Martin Luther King when he was bringing his whole entire posse into Selma. And, and they kind of took over. And, and I mean, the intention was good, right? The intention was, okay, we're here because we want the right to vote, right? And we're gonna hit, we're gonna be here to help you organize that. But you could see the tension arose because the young black guys who had been there, Snick, Snick yeah, yeah, who had been there doing the work, you know what I'm saying, for years or whatever, and you know, basically was they were thrown out of leadership and they were completely their leadership was completely devalued. Like mm-hmm. when the way that MLK and his, and his folks went in there, it was almost like, oh, you young folks, you know, like you don't know any better type of thing. So we definitely see this conflict as something historical. And I think it speaks a lot when it comes to like empowering youth. I, I think that that's also something that our nation is not ready for because the, the youth are really the revolution. Like we are the ones who are saying, like, no, we're done with this respectability. It doesn't work. And actually, it doesn't address the very root of the issue. Like, if we're walking around saying, okay, we need to present ourselves respectably just so we can live, I'm sorry, but that's <laughs> that's completely ridiculous. Like, and, and it doesn't address the actual issue of the fact that white supremacy exists and does not value black life or black bodies or people of color. And that is the real issue. And that these systems were built off of that kind of ideology to maintain white supremacy. And so there's a huge disconnect. And <sighs> to empathize with it, our parents and those the folks that we're speaking of who are coming out of that generation like they are coming from a totally different time in which they did not have privileges which we're afforded today right like so our ancestors fought for us to be able to have access to certain privileges and that we can be hyper visible i think and that we can do without respectability now is only because our ancestors already tried to fight that fight and already tried to come to the table with that and clearly like it didn't work we actually do have to honor that and recognize that like The true fight is in restoring humanity um, and restoring the value in black life. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I sometimes think about is that we do sort of forget about our elders Mm -hmm. and they've been missing from this movement in some ways. I mean, is there is there value in having elders participate and what is it and how do we reach out to them? So one, I don't want it to seem like we're bashing the elders because we definitely work with a lot of dope elders and shout out to all of them um and thank you for your wisdom um Mm -hmm. and your healing that you bring to our our circles and our communities and our work we want to like bridge those gaps and for me a lot of that has been facilitated through conversation and that's like even conversation with my mom and her friends and just kind of talking to them more about where i'm coming from and like how I'm arriving at these ideas. And I think that through conversation, we're often able to understand each other a lot more and come to more common ground that we can like build off of. You know, you when you were talking about Selma and you were talking about how like these generational differences have been going on for a long time and that people were actually operating from very different ideas about how change happens Mm -hmm. in that moment. And for the group of folks that you're working with, what is the idea about how change happens? Because like among the Black Lives Matter folks and talking with different people, like different people have put forward different frameworks. So we've heard stuff about like, we elected these politicians and so now we have to hold them accountable Mm -hmm. as like one framework. Another framework is we need to build solidarity with other struggles and draw those links. And so I'm wondering if you all could share a little bit about what your idea is about how change happens. There are a lot of different people who have a lot of different ideas about how change happens. And 
I personally tend to operate from a both and standpoint. I don't think that any one tactic is going to get us there, right? But we need a diversity of tactics, as we always talk about, and a diversity of ideas and skill sets to get there. And we have to, if we're dealing with things that are as large as systems, right? Like entire systems that entire nations are built upon. You can't just have one trick in your box. (laughs) You need to pull out all the stops and people need to be working at this from all different kinds of angles, ones that we already know and ones that are we have yet to think of in order to dismantle it um, and get to a place where like we reach liberation for our people and for all people. A lot of us share that same sentiment, right, that like we're all here bringing to the table so many different skills, like a variety of skill sets, a variety of backgrounds and experiences. Yeah, like to create possibility models, right? Mm-hmm. Like, so like Black Brunch, that's just one way to, to do it if you if you want to do it, right? Um, but I think that it looks a lot of different ways. It looks like having people in policy. It looks like having people in education to teach the right kind of education. You know, and I, I kind of like that you're saying that a diversity of ideas and a diversity of tactics is the way to go because it is kind of different from the way we've organized in the past, which is that you have this Marxist agenda or you have mm-hmm. something that is a long-term view but maybe having all sorts of long-term views is a good idea. Mm -hmm. So more on a personal tip, what is your long-term view of black liberation specifically? For me, when I just, when I think of liberation in general and particularly black liberation, I just think of what it looks like to operate from a standpoint of radical love and acceptance every day and for everyone to be operating from that place and also for us to just have access to all the things we need and be able to live as a community in harmony and in the ways that we want to, not in the ways that we have to or the ways that have been imposed upon us. I guess Black Liberation, part of it for me looks like Black love and like love, just being in love in all of the ways, like for us to be able to do that with ourselves and with one another because all of these systems have been built to dismantle the families, to, you know what I'm saying, to completely dehumanize us. Mm -hmm. And I think that liberation for black people means like the restoring of our own humanity Mm -hmm. and the restoring of our own love for one another and for ourselves to get beyond this idea that we're just property or that we're we're not actually like human beings, you know, Mm -hmm. because we have... We've definitely internalized a lot of that, a lot of that hate and a lot of that violence and the trauma and the illness is so real. And so I would just I would love for us to be able to to create a community and a society where we can live and and be out of that. Like, you know, I keep wondering if I could see that in my lifetime. It would be really amazing. Um, But, you know, (laughs) right. So dope. Um, But I think we're definitely on the right track for getting it started for the generations to come. Also, Black liberation looks like Black financial liberation and no reliance whatsoever on capitalism or on white dollars whatsoever. And so for me personally, that looks like community financial systems where you're accountable to the community and to one another. And that's what your financial system is based on is accountability and community and and not capitalism or revenue. That's it for tonight's show. We want to say one last time that if you haven't donated, you can. 1-800-439-5732, 1-800-HEY-KPFA, or online at kpfa.org, especially if you like that last interview. Again, $100 will get you The Evolution of Grace Lee Boggs, American Revolutionary, which is a documentary about Grace Lee Boggs. $200 will get you a KPFA Pass It On Pack. We've been your hosts, Alec McDonald and Salima Hamirani. The Apex Collective includes Ellen Choi, Carl, Marie Choi, Che, Michael Yoshida, Pretty Ma- Preeti, RG Lozada, Salima Hamarani, Robin Takayama, and Tara Drabji. To, sus- so to subscribe to our podcasts or listen to past shows, hit up our website, apexexpress.org. If you have a show idea or you'd like to get involved with our collective, email us at apex, apex that's A-P-E-X, at kpfa.org. Our intro and outro music is by Asian Crisis. Tune in next Thursday night at 7 p.m. for another edition of Apex Express.